Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun, you're watching Israeli News Live, and tonight our title of our broadcast, Iodine Disappears from Pharmacies as a Threat of War Looms. Guys, this is not something you're going to be watching tonight on CNN. You're not going to see this in the UK news or any other Eastern European news at this point. We did find one article that kind of helps corroborate what I'm about to tell you, but this was actually first-hand account, or second-hand, I guess should say. Um, my wife's aunt was in need of iodine. She lives in Austria, just not far from where we live here, about four hours away as far as a drive goes, and went to the pharmacy uh, yesterday to be able to buy iodine for her mother. Now, this is an oral iodine. Uh, I forget what she needed it for, something she knew it would help her mother with. She is a registered nurse herself. She goes to the pharmacy to buy the iodine, and there is no iodine to be purchased at all. She was very shocked by this and says to the pharmacist, you got to be kidding me. There no iodine in Austria? And uh, in, in the, well, you know, she's saying, speaking of her specific pharmacy there, and she says, no. She said, in fact, you're not going to find it in any pharmacy at this particular point. She then asked why. Why is it that we, we can't get a hold of iodine? Why, what, this doesn't make sense. She said, would you like to tell me, uh, would you like for me to tell you the truth? And of course, my wife's aunt, of course, says, of course, I want to know what the truth, what's going on? She says, the military and people in politics, they are getting all of the iodine. And she said, why would the military, why would all, why would all of the iodine supplies be going to them? She says, well, they're going to get it first. Let me put it to you this way here. So all the supplies of iodine have been shipped out to the military and things of that nature there. She says, because there is a major threat of war. Well, guys, iodine is used in the case of nuclear war. And it's pretty serious. Remember I mentioned to you the other day, there was someone that commented on my wife's Facebook page, I believe it was, that said that they were giving out iodine tablets. I do have that article, uh, and I'm going to share that with you in just a moment. Before I do, radical Polish soccer fans, not the Polish people, I wanted to put this up here to kind of clarify and straighten out something on the news that I get brought out the other day. And I guess it's more of a misunderstanding on my part because of the way I worded what we were seeing, where the radical soccer fans, and maybe I said it on live stream, but I didn't say it on YouTube. I forget which way I did it. But I did know I did make the comment that it was the radical soccer fans that were burning the effigies and calling for the burning of Jews. Nonetheless, I never intended by by what I said, meaning that the Polish people in general all are like this. And if this is the way I've been taken, I apologize. And I, uh, you know, I don't mean to be misunderstood. I know there's many good Polish people, no doubt, that love the Jewish people. Even as we know, during the time of the Holocaust itself, there were many Polish people that risked their lives in saving the Jews as well. My, my whole purpose in this article, that, or the, the story that we were publishing about the article that we saw there of the radical soccer fans, is the fact that this could even occur in modern times in Poland, especially in light of what happened during the Holocaust when so many thousands of Jews were killed there. How could it happen again? But, as we know, Satan is Satan, and he doesn't really care who the people are. If he can get someone to be radical again in modern times, he's going to do it. But I do want to make sure that we clear that up. It was not the Polish people. I don't mean, I don't mean to imply the Polish people as a whole uh, are wanting to, do, to burn Jews. But it was these radical soccer fans, and it was, it was dis, very concerning to me that that even happened. So I just wanted to stop for a moment and clear the air on that. And my apologies to the Polish people. I do not mean that all of you guys are radical by no means, but it is a problem though when you have certain fans there that are Polish, that do live in Poland, that are acting like this. And I would certainly, as, as far as the Polish government needs to very, take this very seriously, we don't need this type of anti-Semitism rising again. It only gives way to more radical uh, and crazy behaviors as time goes on. 
All right, let's get right back into this news report here. On April the 29th of 2016, Express.co.uk published this article here, Clear and Present Danger of ISIS Nuke Strike Ever Belgian Given Anti-Radiation Meds. The entire population of Belgium, Belgium is to be given a ration of iodine tablets amid fears of an Islamic State dirty bomb attack. The Belgian government has decided to issue the pills which reduce a buildup of radiation in the thyroid gland to households within 100 kilometer radius of a nuclear plant to protect the population against an attack. Now that's what they're doing it for. But what about the Austrian army? What about the elite of Austria? When I say the elite, the politicians, etc. What, what is the pharmacist meaning about that there is a danger of war? A danger of war that they are fearful that it would be using nuclear weapons? Well, let's take a look at what's going on then with Russia. And, and I will say one thing's for sure. The other day we did another article as well that Russia is following in the footsteps of NATO. And what I mean by that when I say they're following in the footsteps of NATO, NATO has brought to the border of Russia in Latvia, Lithuania, they're doing drills everywhere on Russia's border in areas that clearly uh, there was supposed to be an agreement that NATO would not have this type of military presence to begin with. So NATO is clearly in violation of every type of article you can think of, every type of peace agreement they have made with Russia. Russia, on the other hand, is not going against their particular articles that I can see, or at least that I'm aware of, but what is Russia doing? Russia also, when I say falling in the footsteps of NATO, Russia is actually taking their own troops and putting them near the border of the United States off the coast of Alaska there, so that the, the Obama administration can see just exactly how it feels to have military troops a little bit too close. The same with Ukraine. And it's what's going on around Ukraine and uh, on both the south and, and eastern borders of Ukraine with Russian drills that are going on that's making Ukraine nervous, making NATO states nervous, Poland nervous, and everybody else in this whole region there. Uh, because of this. But again, what can NATO expect? They've done all these things to agitate the situation, and now Russia is here to return the favor. Vershbo, uh, Russian snap military exercise straining relationships with NATO. This was the AtlanticCouncil.org today came out with this article here. The man you see pictured here is the one speaking about in this article. Russia is increasingly conducting unannounced military exercises. Now that's what's troubling them. Straining its relationship with NATO, the alliance's number two official said Monday, Russia had staged large drills with no advance notification with increasing, with increasing frequency. NATO Deputy Secretary General Alexander Vershbo said, he said there had been about a dozen in the past two years. Alliance members haven't staged snap drills since the end of the Cold War, he said. Alliance members. He said if there is an interest in Moscow and the stability and predictability, then these exercises are not the way to go. The only thing that gets me, guys, is why doesn't NATO think about this when they're doing military drills on Russia's doorsteps? And, and now granted, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, NATO has announced all of their drills to begin with. So it's not like they haven't. But now NATO's even moving troops in, and it has no, nothing to do with drills either. Moving nuclear weapons in, moving missiles in, everything you can imagine. You know, one thing that I think is interesting, this whole idea of NATO or the United States moving their nuclear weapons out of Turkey... And they were actually, from what some people were writing on articles, they were moved into Europe. I cannot help but think that this, staged, this was a staged coup in Turkey from the very beginning. And Vladimir Putin, for you to be trusting Erdogan in all this, that's not very smart. I, don't, I wouldn't trust him. That coup was done for one reason, and that was for the U.S. to justify to move their nuclear weapons over to Armenia. 
That's what it was done for. Because they needed those nuclear weapons just a little bit closer target for Moscow. And I guess you didn't see that coming. Let's move on. This here is a, uh, a Ukrainian uh, website, or it was in the Ukraine language, this one here. Uh, so we did a Google Translate of this, and it says in, the title was In Crimea, Donbass and near the border with Ukraine, Russia gathered 100,000 groups. Well, they put groups, but it's a hundred, hundred thousandth groups. They're talking about 100,000 military soldiers is what, the, what it's talking about. This is in Radio uh, Voboda.org on August 30th, 2016. Inside the subject line below, I'll be sure to put the links to these articles for you. You'll just have to translate this. A spokesman for the presidential administration, uh, Andriy Lyansko, ATO states that the territory occupied Crimea, Donbass, and the eastern border with Ukraine. Russia gathered about 100,000 soldiers. He said this on Radio Liberty. In Donbass, there's about 40,000 troops along the northern border in the east, and, and about 50 to 60,000 group is constantly changing and being increased and brought three military districts. There is a transfer of airborne units as they are deployed along the border and landed in, the, in Crimea. There is a movement technique only in the Donbass is occupied. Uh, about 700 Russian tanks, said uh, Lien, Lien, Lienzenko. So Ukraine definitely is starting to get nervous. But then again, what did Ukraine do? Well, thanks to the kindness of the Obama administration and a very unexpected person in this, maybe we may retitle this article because of this, document shows Soros, that is George Soros, ran U.S. foreign policy on post-coup Ukraine. Imagine that. Russian insider only six hours ago put this article here out. A tranche of some 2,500 internal documents, mostly Microsoft, Word, Excel, PowerPoint files, as well as PDF files from George Soros Open Society Foundation network of non-governmental organizations, which were obtained from the group DC Leaks, show that Soros and his advisors lorded over U.S. policy towards Ukraine. That's right here on the next page, the word Ukraine, by the way. Continuing on, after the 2014 coup supported by Soros and the Obama administration, ousted the democratically elected Ukraine President Viktor Yukonovich and his government, the leaked Soros documents described how the OSF and Soros International Renaissance Foundation, based at 46 Artima Street in Kiev, worked with the U.S. State Department after the 2014 so-called Euro Maiden themed revolution to ensure that a federalized Ukraine was not in the picture. In addition to George Soros, identified as GS, the leaked OSF documents, others involved in Ukraine include planning, including U.S. Ambassador to Kiev, Jeffrey Piat, David Miel, economic counselor to, to Piat, Lenny Bernardo, OSF, Yevon Hen uh, Stratsky, Executive Director of the I IRF, Alexander uh, Shoshko, Board Chair IRF, Ivan Krustev, Chairman, Center of the Liberal Studies of Soros, and U.S. Government Influenced Operation in Sofia, Bulgaria, Sabine Fritzer, OSF, and Def Barton, Director of the U.S. Agencies for the International Development of U.S. Aid, Ukraine. U.S. aid is a conduit for the Central Intelligence Agency. Soros was present at the post-coup meeting on March 21, 2014 that involved U.S. support for the new Ukraine. One document describes the new Ukraine as a key measure to reshape European map by offering the opportunity to go back to the original essence of European integration. And what do you know? Nice photo there, George Soros and Petro Poroshenko. This is an interesting article, isn't it? Wow, 
Mr. Soros, he does get around, doesn't he? Maybe we'll have to change the title of this video, George Soros Involved in Ukraine Coup. Anyway, one last article I wanted to share with you guys before we sign out for this evening. An infant left on a bus in uh, Modine, Ilet, Israel National News on August 30th today was reported this right here. Uh, Modine, Ilet, it is, it's actually a very nice little neighborhood there, not uh, far from Ben Gurion Airport. It's on your way up to Jerusalem, but it's at the foothills of the mountains there. Uh, and it was disturbing to hear about this article right here. A bus driver was shocked to discover the baby girl left on, on his bus while police warned against an uh, uptick in parental ne negligence. Israel's emergency police hotline 100 received an unusual call Tuesday night. A bus driver reported finding a baby girl while he was searching uh, his bus after he finished his route in the city of Modinilet. Patrol officers arrived at the bus terminal and were shocked to find a girl under a year old had been forgotten on the bus. The father of the infant, a resident of Modinilet, has been detained by the police and taken into questioning at the police station. You know where I think the problem is? Cell phones. Look at it everywhere. I see it on a regular basis. You wouldn't believe how many times myself, even here in Europe and different parts of the countries here, going along, next thing you know, you see a child wandering by itself. Well, the parents are normally not too far behind, but literally some, in some cases I've seen them crying, you know, wondering where their mother is. And I won't mention any countries because we travel, we've been to practically every country here, but I have seen it on more than one occasion. And I do believe cell phones are the biggest cause of the parental neglect. People are too busy playing games and everything else on these things and not paying attention to their children. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Ain't Shalom. There is no peace.